Good morning and God bless you. Happy Palm Sunday to you. Uh, I'm sure someone's tuning in for the first time and I just want to welcome you into the house of the Lord. Or should I say thank you for welcoming me into your house, into your workspace uh, with your children. Maybe you're having them uh, play around the house. Try to get their attention and say it's time for church. It's 11 a.m. and we are so blessed to be here. God is good and his mercy continues to endure forever. Again, thank you for allowing me to spend this time with you today. It is still the Sabbath. Sundays are still for church. Uh, and we just decided to move it online. And so we're so blessed to do so that God has given us another avenue and another door, another tool uh, that he would give us, that he would bless us with to get the message and the hope of the cross out to you and your loved ones and your family. And hopefully someone is hearing this message for the first time. So before we get started, go ahead and share this with a friend. Send this out into your timelines right now. Maybe you should copy the link and text it to someone and say, join us for getting ready for the word of God. Amen. For those of you who don't know, maybe you this is your first time experiencing Passion Week, or you may not have understood before uh, what is the big hoopla about the Resurrection Sunday, about Easter Sunday about why do they call it Passion Week? What's the name for? I don't get any of this. Well, today can be your introduction. This week kicks off the whole plan of God. This is the height of his plan, the zenith of his plan. Uh, everything is centered around what happened this week. God's plan began way back in the Garden of Eden. As a matter of fact, even before that, in eternity past, he had a plan. But everything comes together in this moment. The Bible says in a place called Galatians, chapter 4, verse 4, in the fullness of time, God sent Jesus into the world, born of a woman. And that's what we celebrate at Christmas. But then he ultimately came into this world to die. Imagine being born to die. Your whole purpose of coming out of your mother's womb was to die. That was the purpose of Jesus, and we celebrate that this week. Each day of the week, something unique and special happens, and I want you to spend your Passion Week uh, with me and with us here at St. John TMI. Uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, five days of viewing. Yes, we have something special for you on each day. Some messages and teachings will be longer than others, but we want to express to you the significance of each day. Something unique happens on Wednesday. Something different happened on Thursday. Of course, the death and burial of Jesus on Friday, and his, he, he stays buried on Saturday. And then we'll take you into resurrection morning next Sunday for our Easter. So we want you to not miss it. Save the date. Save the time. Tell a friend. We'll send you notifications to let you know everything that's happening this week as we bring the message and the hope of the cross and of Jesus Christ to you and yours. So as we kick off Passion Week, this is the week that Christ uh, expressed his passion for mankind, his love for mankind through this act, uh, this obedient act from God the Father. Jesus decides that this is the week I'm going to die on the cross according to God's plan and rise from the dead. And so to kick off the week, uh, the Bible gives us a passage of scripture and you'll see a heading on it that says something like uh, Jesus' triumphal entry or the Jesus comes into Jerusalem as king. Depending on whatever version you're blessed to have, uh, it'll have a heading over a section. And so all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, record this story that I'm going to read today. I'm going to be reading it out of the book of Luke, chapter 19, starting at verse 28. Uh, but all of the Gospels record this story, and this happened at the beginning of the week. This is the beginning of Christ entering into his work to save and redeem mankind. So this is what it's all about. This is day one, day one. Type it in right now. Type day one in the comments. Tell someone, text someone. We're starting with day one. Then we'll pick up uh, later on in the week on Wednesday, and we'll continue the message. So let's jump in into day one, Luke 19. Starting at verse number 28. Of course, I'm going to give you a few more verses than usual, like last week. We're going to read about 
14, 15 verses, but I have an emphasis, something I kind of want you to key in on, something I want uh, to grab your attention. And so I'll point that out to you in just a moment. But for now, I'm hoping and believing someone is hearing this story for the first time. So I'm going to read it like you've never heard it before. It's a story that never gets old. So let's start reading at Luke chapter 19, verse 28. And I'm reading out of the NIV, the New International Version translation. All right. It says, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. As you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever written. Untie it and bring it here to me. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Wow. It's kind of like walking into a corner store and you're kind of stealing something. And then they say, hey, give me that piece of candy or that food back or that toilet paper back that's valuable these days. Uh, and you say, the Lord needs it. And they just let you walk off with it. That's what's happening here. The Lord needs it. And apparently that answer was good enough. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks, their jackets, their hoodies, so to speak, on the colt and put Jesus on the colt. That is a donkey. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, watch this, these, here's where we're going. He wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. Wow. Let's go back to verse 41 and let's read verse 41 and verse 42 together. A lot has happened in these 15 verses that we read today. They're taking Jesus into the city. They're proclaiming him king. But all of a sudden, with this, this triumphant moment, his triumphal entry, this moment of, of, of victory, this moment of uh, jubilation, this moment of celebration, kind of like a biblical Mardi Gras was happening out here. He approached Jerusalem, and he started crying. He started crying. My goodness. And look what he says when he cried. If only you knew, if only you knew, if only you had known on this day what would bring you peace, if only you knew what would bring you peace. We're getting ready to pray. Um, I like to do that before uh, I enter into a lesson uh, with you from time to time. It helps us to open our hearts and our minds uh, to be able to understand and comprehend uh, and speak or teach God's word. So this is something I like to do sometimes. And we're going to pray. But before we pray, I want you to type in today's thought, today's idea into the comments. Get it to someone. Write it down uh, in your cell phone. Write it down on your tablet. Write it down on your pencil and pad. If you're old school, you like to do it that way, that's fine. Today's thoughts or ideas, I want to talk around when God's plans are not my plans. When God's plans are not my plans. When God's plans are not my plans. Fourth time, when God's plans are not, are not, are not my plans. So let's pray. Jesus, we need you. 
I needed you a few moments ago to read those verses. I need you uh, to breathe. I need you to speak. I need you to listen. I need you to hear. God, we need you for every part of this process. We needed you to write down a few ideas that we believe you've given us. We need you to speak it, but we also need you to understand it, to comprehend it. We need you to block out distractions. A lot of things can come into the room, can come into this moment and try to distract us. Notifications can come on our devices as we're listening to this message and make us uh, lose focus and get us off track. So, God, we need you. We need you to help us focus. We need you to help us turn off the notifications so we can hear from you in this moment. This moment is yours. Just like we would normally sit physically in a building on Sunday mornings, we give this moment, we dedicate this moment to you. It is yours. You can have it. Speak to us. We need to hear your word more than anything. We love you. We thank you. And we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. When God's plans are not my plans. There's so many things that Jesus did when he came to the planet. Jesus healed sick people. He opened blinded eyes. The Bible gives us stories of him casting demons out of people. The Bible gives us stories of him walking on water. The Bible gives us stories of him uh, riding on clouds back to heaven. The Bible gives us stories of him speaking peace and calm to wind and to waves while they're on a boat. And it seems like the waves and the wind are... And it's getting ready to swamp the ship. And they're getting ready to all drown and die. We've seen Jesus in scripture literally cast potentially thousands of demons out of one individual. Jesus did all of this. There's so much that he did. The Bible says that all of the books that are given to us, the four specifically that mention the deeds of Jesus while he was here on earth, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we call them the Gospels. The Bible says that these books actually aren't even enough. These are just a few things that the Bible has given us to reveal the things that Jesus has done to expose his deity. These miracles we've given you are meant to expose Jesus as God. So the Bible is, 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 is meant to give us these specific miracles that expose Jesus' power as God. That's awesome. I need that. For him to be God matters. It's so important. And we'll talk about that as the days go on and we enter into this Passion Week. But with all of the things that I could grab a hold of and, and grab and hang on to that expose and reveal the truth of Jesus as God, one of the things I love is Scripture reveals Jesus not only as God but as man. This is what sets Jesus and our Christianity, our faith, across, uh, apart from others. This is what makes us different. This is what makes our belief unique. Jesus is not only 100% God, but he's 100% man. And while certain passages of scripture point to and reveal, expose the truth that Jesus is God, there are others, on the other hand, that reveal Jesus as man. So from time to time in scripture, you'll see the phrase or uh, you'll see the wording son of God. But then you'll also see the wording or the phrase son of man. Son of man. To reveal his humanity. Just like the son of man reveals that he is a man, son of God reveals that he is God. So son of God not only reveals that Jesus is the son of God, it also reveals that he is God. He is deity. He is God in flesh. But Luke deals with the humanity of Jesus. So you'll see the phrase more in Luke, son of man. You'll see things in Luke that point to Jesus as a human being. Him uh, having moments of grief. Him sweating because he's nervous and he's under intense pressure in the garden of Gethsemane. And all of these things are written, given to us to expose Jesus as a man. And I thank God that he's a man. He, he's, he's kin to me. He, we, we have something in common that Jesus actually cries. He cries. Today, 
we see a passage in Scripture where it says, Jesus is weeping over the city of Jerusalem. He's weeping over Jerusalem. He's weeping and he's crying. Everything that Jesus does matters. It's all important. But today, I want to key, on, key in on or focus on the fact that Jesus is crying over Jerusalem and the words that he speaks as he's crying. He speaks the words, if only you knew this day, what would bring you peace? If only you knew. In other words, he's saying there's a secret. There, there's something that you're not paying attention to. You have your focus, in other words, on the wrong thing. And if you get your focus in the right place, it can make the difference. So let's, 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 let's jump into this now. Let's see what makes Jesus cry. Perhaps Jesus is crying because there's war taking place. You see it right there. We just read it. Open your eyes to it. There's war taking place in these 14 or 15 verses we read today. There's war taking place right in front of our eyes. You're probably saying, Pastor Gabriel, but I don't see a shield. I don't see a spear. I don't see a sword. I'm not reading of anyone being stabbed. I'm not reading of anyone being shot. I'm not reading of anyone being beheaded. I'm not reading any ramparts being set up, any cannons going off, any helicopters dropping bombs. But it's all there. There is a war taking place in this passage, and I want to open your eyes and expose you to it. There are opposing ideas. In this passage today, there's a war of, of ideas. There's a war of philosophies. There's a war of ideologies. There's a war of plans. There's a war of plans. God, through the person of Jesus Christ, has a plan. But then the people have a plan. And in this passage today, as we kick off Passion Week, I want to turn your attention to the war that's taking place, the clashing of the titans. What's happening here in this passage is so strong, it's so intense, that it brings Jesus to the place of tears where he's crying. There's a clash of the titans. There's opposition in this passage, whether you see it or not. There's opposition in the midst of this triumphal entry into the city. There's opposition in the midst of our Savior, Jesus Christ, getting on a donkey and being crowned as king. There, there's a war. There's opposition taking place while people are willing to throw down their jackets, their coats, their cloaks. They're willing to go to trees and cut down palm branches and throw them on the ground. They were willing to make the trees naked all for this moment. They were willing to go to some men and take their donkey and their colt and bring it to Jesus so he can ride on it. And people were willing to give up their donkey, give up their colt so Jesus could have it all for this moment. Pastor Gabriel, I don't see a war here. It seems like everybody's in unity. It seems like everyone's on one accord. It seems like everyone is united. But there's opposing ideas. When you got saved, when you asked Jesus to come into your life, whether you know it or not, you at that moment entered into partnership with God. You and Jesus, you and God, you entered into partnership. With one another. This is uh, what you and I believe. For those of you who are Christians, I'm hoping someone who is not a believer is watching and you're gonna be one before this day is over. Hopefully, you make the greatest and best decision of your life. But for those of us who are in relationship with Jesus Christ, when we said yes to Him and invited Him into our life, in that moment, that day, we entered into partnership with God. This is why you and I call it the great co mission. We are co-laborers. We come together on this mission. We continue in the mission of Jesus. And Jesus' mission was to reconcile a fallen world back to Jesus Christ. There's a passage in Scripture called 2 Corinthians chapter 5 where it says, Now God has given us this ministry of reconciliation. We continue in this work of bringing this world 
back to God. And so Jesus says, I'm getting ready to leave after he completes this work at the end of this week. We'll celebrate that on next Sunday. And while he's leaving, he says, I want you to continue in this work. So let's lock hands, spiritually speaking, and let's be co-laborers. Let's join together in this great commission, this co-mission. And that day forward, we became partners with God. The Bible says it in another place, Hebrews chapter 3, verse number 14, in the Good News translation, it says, for we are all partners with Christ. For we are all partners with Christ. If we hold firmly to the end, the confidence we had at the beginning. The Bible says we are partners with Christ. Partners with Christ. We are partners. When we come together with God, we came together with him, and we say, God, we are spiritual business partners with you. And we are partners with you because we recognize you had a plan. We came to the party late, thousands of years late. This plan started long before we got here, God. The Bible gives us in a few places that this plan started before you created the world. This wasn't your backup plan, God. This isn't something you thought about when we messed up and we got into trouble and we started doing bad things down here on earth. You have this plan in place before the world even began. Before the foundation of the world, God said, Jesus, I want you to get ready to die for humanity. They're going to try their best to get to me, but they can't reach me. So I need you. I need to come down and go to them because their good deeds are not good enough. Like standing before a judge and I've committed a crime. Let's say I robbed a bank and I say, oh, judge, I'm so sorry I robbed the bank. But but listen, I've started feeding the homeless and I've started uh, helping some people with some COV ID 19 test kits and I'm starting to feed some seniors through this tough time, and um, I ask that you would forgive me. And the judge can say, those are great things, but there still must be a penalty paid for your wrongdoing. This is how it is when it came to God's divine justice. He says, you can still do great things. You're made in my image. You have the ability to do good works, but none of those good works are good enough to pay the penalty for sin. So, Jesus, I need you to go down to them. This was God's plan to get Jesus down to earth. And all of the Bible is the unfolding of God's plan until we get to the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And God's plan has been made manifest through Jesus Christ. And so this was the plan. When you locked arms with God, when you invited Jesus into your life, I don't know whether you know it or not, But on that day, you said, spiritually speaking, Jesus, God, I throw away my plans and I'll take your plan. When you became a Christian and you invited Jesus into your life, you said on that day, God, I surrender my plan and I take up yours. Sounds easy to do. We sing an old song sometimes in church called, I Surrender All. The words sound so nice and melodious and harmonious and so beautiful. And they, 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 they ring and they roll off the tongue so beautifully. But we don't understand the cost, what it really means to follow Jesus. And following Jesus means I surrender my plan and I take up his plan. And here's where you and I fall out with God. When God has a plan and it doesn't seem to match our plan. Glory to God. God has plans. And he says, my plans are not yours. They're a little different. Look at this. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 8 and 9. This is in the Common English Bible. I'm kind of going through a few different translations today than I normally do. But look at what it says in the common English Bible. It says, my plans are not your plans, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. 
Just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my plans than your plans. When you gave your life to Jesus Christ, you gave up the right to do things your way. When you gave your life to Jesus Christ, this is what a relationship with God really means. I want your relationship to be authentic and to be real. I didn't just come through a time of crisis. I know I have more people listening to me. The, the, these, these sermons and these words are more valuable than they were about this time, maybe a month or two ago. So I understand my audience. But, but I want your relationship to be authentic. I don't want to tell you a bunch of fairy tales today. I'm not giving you a pie-in-the-sky relationship with God. I want it to be real. And I'm telling you, when you invite Jesus into your life, that is the day you decide to throw away your ideas, your plans, and you give God your plans. And you, and you open the door to God's plans. You throw away your ideas. You say, God, give me your plans and your ideas for my life. Because God, you just said in Isaiah 55 verse 8, our plans are different. Our plans are different. They're different. My plans are not your plans, the common English Bible says. And since we are partners, we have a plan together. God, I'm going to do your plan. You're saying when you invite Jesus into your life, you want to do it his way. Amos 3, verse 3 says this in the NIV. Can two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? When you entered into partnership with God, you agreed to walk with him. Can two walk together unless there is an agreement? This is a partnership. You're partners with God. You agreed to do it God's way. God, I want to do it your way. And here was God's plan when it came to Jesus Christ. He says, my plan is to establish a kingdom. My plan was to establish a kingdom. And someone who's read this, this story before, maybe once or twice, may say, wait a minute. But, but, but the people were in agreement with Jesus. They were saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus is the king of Jerusalem. Their plans were the same. No, they weren't. They were different. God's plan was to establish a spiritual kingdom. Their plan was to establish a physical, earthly kingdom. I'm going somewhere if you just spend a few more moments with me. God's plan was to establish a spiritual kingdom. Their plan was to establish a physical, earthly kingdom. Whenever God starts something, you may want to remember this. Whenever God starts something, he starts with the invisible first. Whenever God starts something, he starts in the invisible realm first. Whenever God begins a work, he starts it in the invisible realm for invisible. He starts with what is not seen. He starts it on a level that I cannot see. You say, where do you get this from? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. Starting at verse number 3, and we'll go back to the NIV now, our normal translation that we read when you and I are together. Watch what Hebrews 11 verse 3 says. This is what we call the faith chapter in the Bible. By faith, we understand that the universe, the universe, the sun, the moon, the stars, the solar system, the galaxies, the constellations, the planets that we get to see and enjoy. The universe was formed at God's command. So that what is seen, what is seen, what is physical, what I can see with my natural physical eye was not made out of what was visible. So what is seen was not made out of what was visible. The Bible says that God is spirit. God in heaven is spirit. God is a spirit being. He doesn't have flesh and bones like you and I. God is invisible. I can't see God. I can't taste God. I can't touch God. 
I can, in other words, use the natural five senses to connect with God. Because God is a spiritual being, he's spirit, I connect with him in the realm of the spirit. This is why I need to invite invite Jesus into my life. Because Jesus, the spirit of Jesus, comes and lives in my human spirit. And now I connect with God spirit to spirit. So my finite physical body does not connect with God. I have to connect with him spiritually. He's a spirit being. He's invisible. But watch this. An invisible God created everything that we see in this physical, natural universe. That's what this Bible is is saying in this verse. It says, by faith, we understand that an invisible God made everything that's visible. So everything that is now physical, visible, started with an invisible God. So what I'm saying is I'm establishing the precedent with this passage that the invisible started first. Then came the visible. The, 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 the immaterial, the spiritual started first. Then came the natural, the physical things. So everything God does, he starts in the realm of the spirit first. And this is where you and I sometimes miss God and his plan, and we miss his work, and we miss what he's trying to do. Some people are missing everything that God is doing in this season because they are just looking at natural things. They're looking at physical things. Some people are missing things that are taking place because they're only looking and hearing what's around them. This week I had a conversation with a person who's going through a tough time. They're talking with a lot of people. And I could tell by the way they're talking, they're allowing what people are going through to get inside of them. They are focusing on just the visible, the physical, what's happening on the news. This person losing a job. This person doesn't know where their income is coming from. Everything that we see happening now was spoken to us by an invisible God. Nothing should surprise us. Nothing should shock us. To the church of Jesus Christ, I'm asking you, I'm admonishing you, keep your head on straight. Keep your cool. If the world sees us in a tizzy, if the world sees us angry, if the world sees us lose our respect, then how are they going to act? Be calm. God is in control. Jesus is on the ship. So we understand and we recognize that God is doing something. What keeps me smiling? What keeps me telling April Fool's jokes? What keeps me kissing my wife when I go home with everything that's happening? Because I am not looking in a physical, visible world. I'm focusing my attention. I'm choosing to turn my attention to what's happening in an invisible world. And God says, you can see my plan if you can see into the invisible world. If you open your eyes to what I'm doing in the realm, in the arena of the spiritual world. If you say, God, open my eyes to what you're doing in this season. Help me not to just listen to the news. Help me to not listen to friends and loved ones who pour things into my life all the time, a lot of negativity. Help me not to just maybe listen to a spouse or someone, a parent, who just constantly speaks negativity into my life. God, open my eyes to what you're doing. And what you're seeing here is opposing plans. Jesus is crying today because he has one plan, and the people's eyes are opened to another. He has one idea of how to fix this, but the people's eyes are opened to another. And it brings Jesus to the place where he says, I'm teary-eyed. If only they knew what would bring them peace. If only they knew what would bring them peace. You and I struggle with, whether we want to admit it or not, we struggle with being God. You and I sometimes have the idea or take on the idea, whether we know it or not, subconsciously, we think things would go a little smoother, a little better if we were in charge. <laughs> if, if, if our ideas were the world's ideas, if people would only see our point of view, they would get it. If, if, if you would sit back and look at it just from my angle, I know I'm right. We would get it right. The president would get it right if they saw it from my point of view. The government would get it right. The church would get it right. Pastor Gabriel would get it right if they just saw it from my point of view. 
These are my plans. These are my ideas. The problem is when we have plans, they're not always the best. There's a few ideas I, I, I want you to write down. Number one, our plans are temporary and self-centered. Our plans are temporary and they're self-centered. I see that in this passage today. Their plan was a temporary plan. Their plan had them at the center. Their plan was, Jesus, you came to this planet not to save the world. You came to this planet not to bring salvation, to make salvation uh, available to all mankind. Jesus, you came to this planet to set Israel and Jerusalem free from Roman oppression. You may say, I don't, I don't get all of that. This is why I don't read the Bible. The Bible's hard to read. Stop it. Stop bringing your 21st century vernacular into the scripture. If you want to understand everything that's going on, you have to read the Bible historically. Look at the background. Look at what's going on. You may say, Pastor Gary, that's a lot of effort. Stop. You do it to watch movies. I just got done watching a movie, 1917, which is a great movie, by the way. I don't know anything about 1917. I wasn't born then. But I had to understand the movie through the avenue of the year, the time period, what was happening at the time, World War I. It opened my eyes. They didn't have the technology that we have today. So this young man had to be a runner and physically get a message. I had to understand that. I could only understand the point, the concept, the power of the movie when I understood it historically. It's the same way with scripture. You do this when you read books and novels when you read Harry Potter, when you read anything else, when you read books and, and certain things, certain series that have ideas in a time period. So I'm asking you to do the same with Scripture. We're coming in in a time period where the Romans were ruling the world. They were the dominant power. You could say they were the America of their day. And they would go into these nations, and they would make them nation states. They would take these nations over, and they would put representatives, governors, and kings in these places and they would take these nations, and these places would pay tribute, taxes, money back to Rome. And so Rome's in charge here. And we're coming into this scripture in a time where the Israelites, those in Jerusalem specifically for this passage today, believe that Jesus is coming to free them from Roman oppression. The problem is their idea is temporary. If they're just seeing Jesus as a physical, natural king, how long is Jesus going to rule? Will he rule as long as David, maybe 40 years? Will he rule as long as Solomon? Will he rule as some of the other ancient Israeli kings of the Old Testament? Their idea is temporary, and it's self-centered. It says nothing about you and I as Gentiles. If, if Look at it like this. Here's the power of this passage. If Jesus would have listened to them, Salvation wouldn't have been available for you and I. The door would have been shut for you and I as Gentiles to enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, but the door would have been opened for Israel. So Jesus saying, I, I hear your plan, but your plan is temporary and it's self-centered. We see it a few verses up in this passage in verse number 11 of Luke 19. It says, they thought the kingdom was going to come at once at that moment. They thought as Jesus was talking, this kingdom is going to magically come down out of the sky and he's going to take over everything and we're going to live good forever. But that's the problem with our plans, with our ideas. Our plans are temporary and they're self-centered. Our plans, watch this, are symptom-oriented. Our plans, number two, are symptom-oriented. Our plans, our ideas, most of the time what we have in mind for God to do is symptom-oriented. God, if you just do it my way, if you just handle it like this, if you could just see it from my angle, it is symptom-oriented. The cause of the problem that they were facing was not just a war with Rome. It was not Roman oppression. Those were symptoms. The cause was sin. Sin is an ugly thing. Sin is a deadly thing. Sin poisons like a black mamba snake. 
Sin is an ugly thing. Sin is, is, is nasty. Sin only does one thing. Sin kills. Sin brings darkness. Sin destroys. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. Sin's wages, sin's payment, sin's compensation. The compensation for doing wrong, doing evil is death. Whether you know it or not, when you and I do wrong, things die. I don't care if it's something as big as murdering someone or something we can consider, consider to be small, like telling a white lie. Sin brings death. You may say, what, what, what death does a white lie bring? A white lie can begin to kill trust. Sin always brings death. If I tell my wife a white lie and later on she finds out the truth, it can begin to kill trust in our relationship. Sin always brings death, decay, destruction. Everything you and I are experiencing in this planet right now is a result of sin. Sin's presence in this earth, sin's presence in this universe. Sin. Sin has affected everything. Sin has affected the cosmos. Sin has affected the weather. Sin has, has affected seed and plant life. Sin has affected seed time and harvest. Sin has affected our health. Sin has affected our mind, our memory, our emotions. Sin has affected everything. And when we invite sin in, it kills. It brings death. And the problem is all of our plans want to go after the symptoms, things that make us feel good, things that, 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 that would bring us comfort at night. Right now, we all have a plan, all have an idea to do something to help out with COVID-19. We all can say, hey, let's do this to feed our seniors who can't go out and go to the grocery store and gather food to eat. Hey, let's help out the homeless people with giving them portable uh, uh, sinks and washrooms. Hey, let's help out uh, maybe some of our veterans. Let's help out those who are unemployed, who don't have income right now. Let's help out uh, those who can't make it to church on Sunday. Let's do whatever we can to bring them content all week long, on Sunday mornings, on Wednesday nights. Let's prepare things for them. All those are symptom-oriented. But the cause is this pandemic. And until we find a cure, a vaccine to cure this pandemic, all of those things are great, but they're symptom-oriented. All of those things are wonderful, and we should do those things, but they're symptom-oriented. That's how it is spiritually with our plans, with our ideas. Everything we can think of to fix our problems that give temporary band-aids, our stimuluses to help our economics, you're going to need more money. I hate to break it to you. It, it's important. That's a good thing that our government did. But in a few months, you're going to need some more. That's symptom-oriented. Everything we can think of, the plans we have, are symptom-oriented. It was the same way when it came to this issue with Israel and Jesus. They said, Jesus, get us out of this oppression. The Romans have their foot on our neck, so to speak, and we need to be set free. Come on, set us free. But their plans were symptom-oriented. But here's the plan about God. Here's the thing about God. While our plans are temporary and self-centered, God's plans are continuing. They're perpetual. They're ongoing. They're enduring. They're long-lasting. God's plans are perpetual. They're ongoing. The thing about God is when I decide to take on God's plan and do it God's way, his plan almost always outlasts my lifetime. His plan is so much bigger than me. My ideas, my plans have me at the center, have my ideas, my opinion, my focus, my thoughts, how I feel. It's all about me, 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 me. But when I begin to step back and get God's plan, God's idea, God's focus, God has more than me in mind. 
This is what he meant when he began to open the door for his plan to Abraham. I'm getting excited. I'm trying to calm down because I wanted to make sure you got this today. But when he had a plan to give to bring Jesus into the world, he says to Abraham, because you have decided to believe me, I will credit you righteousness. And I want to give you a son, and a child, offspring, he said to him. He said, I want to give you offspring. And Abraham was just praying for one kid. Give me a son to be my heir. And God was saying, you're praying for one kid so you can give all your money and your, all your belongings to. But I have something so much bigger, Abraham. Through you, I'll bless generations to come. My plans are bigger than yours. As a matter of fact, Abraham, the only reason I'm blessing you is because I want you to be a blessing dispensary. He says it like this. I will bless those that bless you. He says, I will bless you, and I'm sorry, he says, I will bless you, and you will be a blessing. I will bless you, and you will be a blessing. That's the only reason I'm blessing you, because if I can get a blessing through you, I can get a blessing to you. And I need someone to be involved in my plan who can recognize, who's grown to the place of spiritual maturity, spiritual maturity where they say, it's not all about me. There's a plan that God has me in on, and it's so much bigger than me and mine. As a matter of fact, for so long, it's always been about me and my family and my house. Even through this time, to be quite honest with you, I'm a little nervous. Because people have asked me, what do you think God is doing with this? Do you think this is a sign of the end times? You know all those spiritual questions they ask of uh, faith leaders. All of these things. And they said, do you, do you think that God is allowing this to bring the church back to him? And I'm just praying and believing, and I'm hoping so, but I'm not sure. Because what's concerning me, what's, what's, what's scaring me is this can go either way. I can use this time of of, of social distancing to draw closer to God, or this time of social distancing can lead to my spiritual distancing. I can get to the place where I sit at home, and spiritually speaking, I get my field and my feast of the food. They bring it to me on a platter every Sunday morning. I can watch it in my living room. Every Sunday after, I can watch the message on demand. I can fast forward through parts I don't like if I'm not watching live, if I watch the recording later on. And I can get to the end. I can click off when they get to the part of inviting people into a relationship with Jesus. Because after all, I don't need that. I'm already in a relationship with them. It's, it's about me. And my concern is the church can go one of two places. We can get to the place where we say, God, I want to see what you're doing through us. Open our eyes to how you can use us in this season. Or I'm concerned the church can say, give me mine at my plate on Sunday morning. And as a matter of fact, I'm getting so used to this online thing. I don't know if I'm going to go back to church when they open up again. This online thing is pretty good. I don't have to talk with people. I don't have to connect with people. People don't have to be in my business. I don't have to be accountable to anyone. I don't have to be responsible for anything. And that concerns me. Because our plans, if you look at them close, I'm getting into business today. I know you're not feeling the best right now, but it'll get better, I promise. But our plans, most of the time, if you look close, have us at the center. Even our discerning of God's voice. This is why the Bible says in the New Testament, when it talks about the gift of prophecy in the church, it says in times past under certain dispensations, God was speaking through men and they were pretty much inerrant because God had to use them in that way because there was no written word of God. But now we're under the age of grace where God is speaking in the age of the church, where God is speaking through individuals. But it's saying now since we're in that age, you now have to test what people say. Everything now that I hear from God, I have to recognize that is being filtered through you. And your perspective, your background, your experiences, your upbringing is all in the filter of you. It, it's all inside of you. So now when you say God said, I now have to consider the fact this person's background. This person's experience, when, when this person was raised up, because that may be true because that person is 60-something years old, but that's not necessarily true now that I'm 34. 
don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to sow discord. But I'm just saying now these things matter. And most of what we call God a lot of times, if we look close, it's us. Most of what we say is God's idea, God's plan is coming through the filter of us. So now God says it's not just you. It's not just your voice, but in this age, I want a team of elders and apostolic people who are mature, Galatians 6, verse 1 type people, who can come together and discern my voice. Because my plans are not about you. My plans are to use you, but my plans are so much bigger than you. They're long-lasting. They're ongoing. They're enduring. Number two, my plans, while yours are symptom-oriented, God's plans are cause-oriented. God's plans are cause-oriented. God's plans are cause-oriented. God's plan was to rid mankind of sin. And he says the only way you have the power to live a righteous life, a good life, is through Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, all your good deeds, they're nice. They're nice things that you could do. But the only way you will be pleasing to me is through Jesus Christ. When you apply his work to your life, when you put your trust in his work and what he's done later on as Pastor Gabriel and churches around the world celebrate Jesus' work on the cross this Friday, when you put your trust in what Jesus has done, because Jesus lived a perfect life, he was the only person to ever walk this planet and not do wrong. He was tempted like you and I, so I thank God when I pray to him and when I pray through Jesus Christ, he can understand what I'm facing, what I'm going through, when I need help, when I need strength. He can say, I know I've been there. And I have the power and the ability to say no, and I can give that power and that ability to you. This was God's plan. His plan was not symptom-oriented. God's plans are cause-oriented. So, maybe write this down. So the lion's share of God's work in our lives is to get us to buy into his plan. The lion's share of God's work in our lives is to get us to buy into his plan. God's heavy lifting, and we know he doesn't have to heavy lift, but you get what I'm saying. God's heavy lifting, most of God's work, most of what takes us so long to reach places God wanted us years ago is because he said, I want you to do it my way. So what happens? When God has a plan that's different from our plan, and we don't want to change, what happens when we are standing flat-footed, so to speak, in our will? Our will is tough. Our will is strong. Some of us are very strong willed. And we say, I just don't want to do it that way. I, I, maybe I'm speaking to someone. I don't want to take on that calling. I don't want to join a church. I'll just continue to do it from a distance. Maybe you've experienced church hurt. And I don't want to downplay it, but it's just amazing to me. The church is the only place where you get hurt once and it's over. You've experienced bank hurt. I'm sure there's a teller that hurts your feelings from time to time, but you never said, I'm not going to a bank again. You've experienced nightclub hurt. Maybe a bartender, maybe a bouncer, maybe someone at the door didn't let you in. I don't know. And you never said, I'm never going to a club again. But the church seems to be the only place where people say, I've experienced hurt. Come back if you've been hurt once. You can come back again. We're imperfect people representing a perfect God. But what happens when you stand there and you won't let go of your plan and God is reaching out his hand saying, take my plan? This is when God sends or allows crisis. And this is why this message makes sense with everything that's going on in the world today. When your plan is up against God's plan and you choose or you refuse, excuse me, to conform to God's plan, this is when God will send or allow trouble or a crisis. 
to steer you in the right direction. This is why I thank God for trouble. This is why I thank God for trouble. This is why I thank God when I look back on some tough life crises I've had to face. And there are many more, I'm sure, in the days ahead. I'm, I haven't arrived. I haven't seen everything. I'm not old. Um, and so I know I still have days ahead. But just for the things I've faced up to this point, this is why I thank God for these crises. Write this down because trouble can be used by God to steer me back to his plan. Trouble can be used by God to steer me back to his plan. Let me give you a few examples and then I'm done. The Bible gives us a man in scripture by the name of Saul. His name, of course, will be changed to Paul. We've been talking about him the last uh, few weeks, so hopefully you know his name by now. Um, Acts chapter 9, verse number 5, in the King James Version, I want you to read that today. Because the King James Version includes something that was taken out of some of the others. Acts 9, verse number 5, in the King James Version, says this. This is Paul's encounter with Jesus. Jesus talks to Paul. Paul responds, and he said, who art thou, Lord? Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, this was Jesus talking, I am Jesus, whom thou persecuted. Watch this. He says, it is hard for you to kick against the pricks. It is hard for you to kick against the pricks. Another translation may say, it's hard for you to kick against the goals. But the King James Version is the only version that has this left. An ox gold or prick was a stick with a pointed piece of iron on the edge of it. And they would use the tip of it to prod into an ox while it was plowing. And every once in a while, the ox would get angry and would kick against the prick, against the ox gold. But every time it kicked, it would only cause that piece of iron to stick and drive down deeper into his flesh. So in other words, the more the ox kicked against the ox gold or against the prick, the more damage it would do to the ox. The more the ox rebelled, in other words, it seemed like the more the ox would suffer. This is what Jesus was saying to Paul. He says, Paul, listen, I've been after you for a long time. And you have been running from me. How long are you going to kick against what I want to do in your life? And the more you're kicking, the more it's hurting you. So here's what's going to happen, Paul. You're going to go blind for three days. And you're not going to know which way to go. You're going to need people to lead you and to guide you around. And you could choose to do this my way and walk into my plan for your life. Or you can continue to kick against the pricks. You can go with my plan or you can go with your plan. But I have news for you, Saul, Paul, you won't beat me waiting. I've been around a long time, a lot longer than you, than your 70, 80, 90, 100 years you'll spend on this planet, and you will not beat me waiting. So, so how long will you kick against the pricks? And God will use trouble in our lives. He will use crises in our lives. To open our eyes to his plan. Give me, let me give you one, a few more. And then I'm done. Moses and the children of Israel. Throughout the Old Testament, after Moses had died, and the children of Israel would continue to turn away from God, God would raise up these, oppos these nations in opposition to Israel, these enemy nations, Babylon and Persia, the Greeks. Uh, you'll see it in Daniel. And now in the New Testament, Rome, this was all spoken by God in Daniel. You'll see it there. And now Rome, in this case, I'll raise up these nations to occupy Israel until I have your attention. I will allow crisis and trouble to come into your life until you open your eyes to my way of doing things, until you open your eyes to my plan. Last example, our, Peter. Peter, I have a plan for your life. I came into your life. Maybe we'll deal with this next week. I don't know. I came into your life, and I gave you a miracle of fish. 
your business was on the verge of failing. You weren't catching any fish. And if you didn't catch any fish, you didn't have any product to sell. So I gave you this catch of fish, not so you could sell it and walk off and be blessed, but to open your eyes to me. Instead, Peter, when times got hard, you went back to fishing again. And he has an encounter with Jesus in John 21, where he's back to his old way of doing things. He's got his nets out, and he's not catching any fish. And Jesus says, do I have your attention now, Peter? You're not catching anything. And God will allow trouble in our lives. He will allow things to fail. He will allow things to not work until we enter into God's plan for our life. And this is why Jesus is crying. I'm closing here. Acts 19, 40, I mean Luke 19, verse 42 again. This is why he started crying. He says, if only you knew Jerusalem. Israel, what would bring you peace? But now it's hidden for you from your eyes. You don't want to open your eyes to see it. I have a plan to set you free spiritually forever. But your plan is symptom oriented. Your plan is focused on you and is self-centered. So you may say, Pastor Gabriel, I see this message today. And I see I may be at a place in my life where I'm ready to admit I have been running from God for a long time. And I see that God is using just a multitude, a myriad of, of different circumstances and troubles in my life right now to get my attention. He's cleared my schedule. I have nothing to do. I can't go to restaurants. I can't go to concerts. I can't watch sports. I can't go to work. I'm at home. I'm working remotely or I'm unemployed. He has my children at home. We were too busy for God this time one month or two months ago. But I see now he may be using all of this to get my attention. He may be using this to open my eyes to his plan. So what do I do when God's plans are not my plans? When God's plans are not your plans? I suggest you get quiet. Begin to listen. Begin to sit quiet and hear God's voice. This is why I'm trying to get you back to the basics again for some of you of just praying and reading the Bible every day. Where you're getting his voice, his counsel, his will, his ways, his thoughts, his ideas back into your life, back into your mind again. Where all of a sudden now you start recognizing his way of doing things. He just told us in Isaiah 55 verse 8, his plans are not our plans. It could have been going in different directions. When God's plans are not our plans, he says, get quiet and listen for me. If only you knew what would bring you peace. Peace is not in your net worth. Peace is not in your 401k and in your bank account. Peace is a state of spiritual rest. Write that down. Peace is a state of spiritual rest. And it's only available to us through Jesus Christ. Hopefully you're recognizing that my messages the past few weeks have been tying together. Some things are being repeated or rehearsed over again. I'm repeating certain things on purpose so you can internalize them, take them in. When God's plans are not your plans, begin to get quiet. Humble yourself and say, God, I want to listen to your plans again. Show me your way of doing things. It's a possibility, God, that I've made a mistake in the past, even when I thought I heard your voice. And I was filtering your voice through me. But God, now I want to hear you clearly. I want to filter your voice through your word because your word reveals your character. So I want to filter what I believe you're speaking through the Bible. I want to begin to ascertain your voice through prayer. 
to know how you speak. When God's plans are not our plans, get quiet and listen for God's plans again. This is what I believe God wants to do as we begin the start of this Passion Week. There's so many themes, so many ideas, so many theological concepts that we can roll over into. So many therapeutic thoughts that I could give you. So many symptomatic sermons that I could give through your airwaves. Everything is going to be better. Everything is going to be all right. And it will be. These things seem like they're going to last forever. But the Bible says this will pass. Weeping and crying lasts for a, light, for a night. But joy comes in the morning. Many of you are in the night season right now. But joy is going to come again. You'll have a job again. You'll get money again. I promise. But what I'm trying to get you to see is the start of this Passion Week, this whole thing, I wanted to open your eyes to surrendering to God's plan. Saying, God, when we pushed you up on that horse, on that donkey, excuse me, and began to throw things on the ground and call you king, you were a king. But you were first a king in another realm. And our eyes weren't open to it. So God, where my life doesn't match yours, where my plan doesn't match yours, get rid of it. Knock it out the way. Exit out. Destroy my plan. And get me back on track to what you've called me to do for my life. Some of you, this isn't going to sound good at the risk of sounding insensitive. But I'm just believing and I'm speaking what I believe God has given you. Some of you, you're not feeling it. You may not be able to come to the place where you admit it or recognize it now because your eyes are, are welled up with tears and you're hurting. But some of you are going to look back on this time. You're going to say, thank you, God, that I got laid off that job and I was unemployed at that time. Because all of a sudden, that no turned me to your yes. And God, my plan, if I would have stayed at that job, my plan was not going to be your plan. I'm a witness and I'm a testimony to this. I could only go so far in certain things in the secular market. And it seemed like so many doors were closing. And we preach and talk so much and get happy about the God that opens doors. But God, Scripture also mentions he's a God that shuts doors. He's a God that opens and shuts doors. God will hem you in. This is the hindering work of the Holy Spirit. When God through his spirit will say no to something, he won't allow you to succeed in something. Or he will only allow you to get so far in something. So when you see that door closes, he'll now turn to this yet. And I begin to think and feel like, am I a failure? Nothing's working. I would cry sometimes and I would go home with my wife, my family. There's so many ideas, so many thoughts, so many things that weren't working. So many plans and things that I had that just seemed like it was hitting a wall and it would stop. But now I see if all those doors were opened, I wouldn't be here. God had to shut all those doors so now this one would open. And I'm beginning to notice now that I'm planted here and doing this, God's plan, many of those doors are starting to open again. Many of those business plans and ideas, many of those goals I set. God won't just cast those to the wayside. The only time God throws those away is if they'll begin to push us away from his plan. But God loves us to enjoy general things, business ideas, plans, set goals. But he says your priority first and foremost needs to be my plan, my idea, my way of doing things. If you had only known on this day what would bring you peace. And I'm here to tell you today for someone watching what's going to bring you this peace in this season it's Jesus Christ. It's not the news. It's not the president. It's not messages from friends. Yes, they can say encouraging nice things. That's great. But above everything else, a relationship with Jesus Christ is what's going to bring you peace. And for those of you who know Jesus, you're in relationship with him, increasing your strength with Jesus Christ is going to bring you peace. Increasing your, strengthening your relationship with Jesus Christ is going to bring you peace. So wherever you are right now, invite him into your life. If you've never done this before, I want to pray this with you. It's really quick. Jesus, come into my life. I invite you in. 
I put my trust in your work on the cross. I believe you died and rose from the dead. I believe you came to the planet for me and to save mankind. Save me, change me, make me more like you. I invite you in. I'll never be the same in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says when you pray that and you believe it in your heart, Jesus comes and he lives on the inside of you through his spirit. And now he'll begin to speak to you. He's a spiritual God, and he'll begin to speak to your human spirit. So don't just look for him in just physical things. When things get crazy in this physical world all around us, look for him. Look for him in the spiritual things. Look for him to speak peace. People may say, I don't see your God in your life, Gabriel. You seem to have the same financial struggles. You seem to have everything seems to be the same. You don't seem to be rich. But the difference comes with how I'm handling this season. How the world is going crazy, cussing each other out, at odds with one another. They say domestic violence cases are on the rise, child abuse cases are on the rise. It's normal through times of economic downturn. I speak with friends and others who are real emotional right now, say things they don't mean. So it's tough. Where's your God at this time? The difference is in my peace. Spend time with God each day. Don't allow anger to get the best of you. Quiet your soul, your will, your emotions so you can hear God. God bless you and keep you. I'll see you Wednesday when God's plans are not my plans. I get quiet to hear God's plans for my life. Surrender to his plan, to his will for your life. And you will never be the same in Jesus' name. I'll see you Wednesday as we enjoy Passion Week with one another. God bless.